tēnā tātou i te, e te whare, um, ai kopia tōku ingoa, he uri tēnei nō konei nō te whenua nei, um, Ngāti Kahu, Ngāti Pang, Ngāti Rangi, Ngāti Hangarau. Um, so I'm, I'm actually from this whenua that this kura is built on. Um, just down the road is Ngāti Hangarau and just across that way is Ngāti Kahu or the Wairoa Hapu um, and that's my father's side. Um, <coughs> I s and I whakapapa to Te Aroa Waka on um, my mum's side mainly um, and live in Maketu which is a coastal village <coughs> about 40 minutes that way um, and I was asked by one of the I know the organisers of the event, of the um, conference and um, we always work, you know, do what we can for each other. So when I got asked, I was like, of course, of <laughs> course, and um, wasn't sure what I was going to be talking about, but um, this seemed to fit it and the timing seemed to be right to talk about the port case and um, in the context of integrated management. So my background isn't actually planning. Um, my, my working background is planning and policy, but um, my academic background is science. Uh, and I really thought I was going to be this marine biologist and it sounded real cool at the time and swim with dolphins and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> uh, and, you know, watch whales. But um, I ended up on a pathway that took me um, into the sort of rights and um, justice sort of um, sphere. S and that's where I stayed for the last 20 years. I've been in that RMA policy making sort of space. And, um, you know, so I have a lot of experience about the ups and downs, the, the, the wins and the losses, and how long that policy cycle takes to see change and um, to, to uh, yeah, see the fruits of your work. It's a long cycle. <coughs> but in the case of the port, um, we were a um, group of, I, I worked for Ngai Te Ranga Iwi at the time, although uh, I had, had no loyalties to any, because I am from Tauranga Moana, all of the iwi, and so my loyalties were with Tauranga, at a Tauranga Moana level. They weren't, I didn't like to get into the politics of within the tribe, so um, I, that was the kaupapa that drove our case. Um, and we had, so we had all of the hapu involved in this port case, we had all of them giving evidence. It was quite a drain on in terms of resourcing, but it was interesting the outcomes and the process that it, that the court took to get us to those outcomes, and they all relate back to integrated management. So this is what we're going to cover in my talk. This is what I cover. Um, um, just a, if, I'm not sure who in the room knows about RMA stuff and what the level of understanding is, so we're just going to have a bit of a 101 covering um, of integrated, what integrated management is. Um, we're going to, and then I'll take you through the port of Tauranga proposal or the application for resource consents and what that involved and then what that involved in the planning context and <coughs> what our case, what the Tauranga Moana case, the prim prim premise of the case w were, uh, the the main um, arguments were, and how the planning framework for the region, pretty much for the region, uh, dealt with the original application, and then how the decision makers who are implementing the planning framework in the region, how they dealt with it, and then how the court dealt with it. And we sort of summarise it at the end about whether we're actually on track to achieving integrated management or not. So I think it depends who you ask. <laughs> I mean, if you ask a planner, they're going to give you a real planning, very sterile kind of <laughs> view of what integrated management is. If you asked a Māori practitioner, I think they'd say something like, oh, it's whakapapa and everything's interrelated and interconnected and that sort of thing. And that's where I, that's my view too, is that, um, it's not actually, it's, yeah, it's a, I don't like the word holistic, it's about whakapapa and how everything in the taiao is connected. Um, integrated management, though, as a concept, 
is recognised across the world and everyone, I mean, all countries use it in their environmental planning and management regimes. Um, one of the leading RMA Pākehā practitioners in, in New Zealand, Raywin Pert, she calls it, she says it's a process, not an end goal, and I agree with that one as well, that we're actually talking about people get confused between it being something we're trying to achieve as an end goal or whether it's more about embedding systemic, systemic change. Um, so, oh yeah, it's about, they call it a holistic approach and sometimes I think that's actually, where that's actually going is, is saying that it, when it's used in that way, it's about people understanding the environment more, which is a bit different to whakapapa and you know, our, our Māori view of it. Um, and there's all the principles that make up different ways to achieving integrated management um, are built into these management frameworks. And most of the explanations that you'll find online or in your research they'll be non-Indigenous ones, so they won't be the very, the, the very traditional planning um, perspective. Oops, oops, that's gone off the page. Oh, I don't know what that is. So really it's about looking at all, of, all, of, all effects or all activities and the impact that they have on the environment all at once, not um, in silos. So we're not looking at um, the discharge of wastewater that's happening there and then the discharge of contaminant that's happening here and then the runoff that happened there. You look at, you know, you, you have to look at all of those types of effects and what they're, and over time too, so it's a spatial and a temporal um, approach that you take. But we've, I found that a lot of the explanations that are out there around what integrated management is are really about people. So they're really about um, people with, you know, the, this cross jurisdictional boundaries, administrations, agencies have got different responsibilities. That's a really real planning way to look at it instead of. Um, instead of it being really about the environment, it's actually about people, managing people. So, yeah, and that, it, it recognises that everything, it, it says it recognises that everything is connected from maunga maunga ki, ki te moana, and that theoretically it should provide the key ingredients for a good framework, right, to, for managing the environment. Some examples from New Zealand, and, and this is like, in terms of the planning hierarchy, this is the, one of the higher, straight under the RMA, is the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement. And that, that defines how the regions need to be managing their, and, and de developing their rule books, and managing to manage the environment in the region. Um, so that's just a quick um, example of what a policy about integrated management can look like. So can you guys see? No. I'll oh, stand on the side. So what is it really? <laughs> so I still think it's about a concept that places people at the centre and not actually the environment. And it's a form of people management rather than a process for achieving balanced decision making. Um, this is one of those definitions that sort of supports what my view of it is and I took that from the um, integrated catchment management um, research that Auckland City Council did uh, and they say that, I mean right here it says integrated catchment management addresses the governance of human activities so it's really coming back to that human element, it's not a, it's the people management type of thing. And so why do we need it? You must be thinking, well it's to regulate fellas like this. <laughs> 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 
and to regulate people impacts and the way that people take and use the environment and the act those activities that they you know perform to take and use parts of the environment they they need to be regulated and so you know it's uh it sounds good, but it, in theory it sounds good, but it might not be all that efficient. So the Tauranga, uh, the Port of Tauranga case, the they have an expansion proposal and it's still live. We're only halfway through that process, but um, so what I'm sharing today is all on public record, pretty much. But the proposal that they wanted to do uh, for their pr expansion involved 800 metres of new wharf, um, so you had 385 on one side of the harbour and then 500, oh sorry, you had 800 on one side on the Mount Manganui side, 500 that way and 300 north, uh, south sorry, and 385 on the Tauranga side of the harbour. That's a lot, that's a lot, that's the, you know, that's a lot of new wharf. But they also wanted to do some reclamation, which is, was, you know, nearly five hectares worth of reclamation, five hectares. And they also wanted to do some dredging as part of that. And they ha the, currently they hold a dredging consent that allows them to take nearly, a, I think it's nearly a million cubic metres of sediment, a million. And if you put all that sediment in containers and line them up, you'd line them all, you'd line them up and they would reach Australia. That's how much it is. Um, so they've already got consent to do part of that dredging, but they needed to dredge more because they've, the new wharf takes them into areas where there's been no dredging before, which is back, back down here, sort of on both sides. So they wanted to take another million cubic metres of sediment out of the harbour channels. Um, so this is the Mount Monganui side, and that's the soft, what they call Sulphur Point. And you can see the reclamation. This is the latest plan too. It's um, not the one that they started with. So they've cut, they've pulled back a bit from Whareroa. One of the um, oldest pa in Tauranga Moana is is here. Whareroa, Marae and it's been ring-fenced by industri industry and um, is um, not, yeah, not in a good situation anyway. And so they've pulled back a little bit. They've, the port is, uh, as an offer of, oh, you know, we're doing the right thing. We're, we're pulling back from Whareroa and the sensitive activities that Whareroa and the community um, undertake. But this is the area that they need to dredge between the two wharfs and this hatched area here. And that's going to take, potentially they want to take another million cubic metres of, of sediment out there and dump it out, um, out at the main ocean beach. Um, <coughs> so you can see the new wharf structures there, there, and it's to allow them to have the three, three mega ship mega container ships parked up on that side, which are huge, they're huge, the mega sh container ships, and um, more logging and um, fuel, fuel bunkering uh, facilita facilities on this, on the Mount Monganui side. But, so the, the case that Tauranga Moana put together and was coordinated between the three iwi and, and all of the hapu involved was about uphold, you know, the duty to uphold the mana of our, of our harbour, who we see as the tupuna, te awanui, um, to protect our relationship with our harbour, to, to ensure that the decisions that are made are compliant, compliant with, the, um, with the planning instruments that we have fought hard to get, you know, with... Um, so it's not when you're fighting to get these rights and rec uh, recognised in the planning framework, you, you might finally succeed and then they don't even implement them. Right. It's the next job is to you know, do things like this to make sure that they're implemented properly. So that was another reason underpinning our um, involvement. 
we wanted to be able to give our, our mokopuna a, a sort of landscape that, they, that we recognised that, and share that with them. We wanted them to have a glimpse of what we've been um, fortunate to grow up with. Um, and, so we, and we also wanted to highlight the fractures in the system. Our participation gave us that opportunity and it also gave us the opportunity, sorry, down here, I don't know why it's done that, um, to highlight past failed, failed decision making um, and that, that was uh, another reason for participating. So the planning context for the port case was started with the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement, that's that hierarchical thing, came, drops down into the regions and the regional planning instrument must give effect to the national policy statements. In our regional plan, it has a special designated um, area called the port zone, and that zone was implemented like in the early RMA days, early 90s, uh, yeah. And that zone gives the port the right to do a lot of what they want to do um, with very minimal oversight from the regional council or um, need to get permits to do what they need to do. So controlled activity status is like really easy. It's almost permitted activity, which means you can just you know, stroll on in and do whatever you want. So um, all of that dredging, the wharf, you know, the however many kilometres of wharf, 1.2 kilometres of wharf, the 1,000 cubes of dredging and on oh, the reclamation is a controlled activity in our planning books and our planning rules and that's disturbing. <laughs> um, in the evidence and legal submissions the port relied heavily on the port zone rules and especially this controlled activity status. The RMA determines that a controlled activity status must be granted, but subject to conditions. So it must be granted, they say. And so every, every council plays on this must be granted, must be granted, but they forget to, to acknowledge the part after that that says subject to. So you still need a complete application before you can <coughs> have your controlled activity status granted or you still need to do a, an assessment of effects for your controlled activity for you to get a resource consent. Um, that has been really poorly implemented in the region and our decision that we've got from the Environment Court on this case emphasises that a controlled activity isn't, isn't a given. It doesn't mean you're going to get your consent. It means you have to do this, this and this, A, B and C, and then you might, then you should be able to get your consent. Um, so that was, and we, if I remember I went back, um, I talked about why we did that, why we participated. Well, one of the things was that to make sure that they were, that the decision makers were in, um, implementing the planning provisions properly, making sure that the port were compliant, well, that was, the outcome was that we got that decision, we got that finding from the Environment Court that says, no, it's not a granted, it's not a, it's not a guarantee that you're going to get your consent. You still have to do this, this and this, and you haven't done that. And those are wins, those are small wins <laughs> to take away from um, big cases like this. So the port currently, too, currently holds over 30 consents for whatever they do for, to run their operation and to keep developing it and to maintain their wharf structures and to do maintenance dredging and a whole lot of other things, discharge stormwater, over 30 consents they hold. So just think about that in the context of this in integrated management. How, how can you achieve integrated management when you're managing a, a port operation in 30, at least 30 silos? It's probably impossible. And the other thing was that we f we um, had pushed and pushed before that the, that the port weren't complying with those 30 consents. 
but the 30 consent said you still need to do kaimoana monitoring, you need to do this, that and the other, and they weren't doing any of it. And the regional council, who's the enforcer, they were the ones that are meant to jump on it and say, give them a warning and issue an abatement and all this sort of process stuff. They should just go on there and said, get your act together, Port. You're a multi-million dollar international private company. Get your act together and um, start doing the right thing with your consents. But they didn't. And the court decision in this case was very critical of the regional council as well f as a result of their lack of um, enforcement and lack of administration for the, their consents that they issue. So the decision making by an independent decision maker f for the application, it was a funny application because it went through a council um, process to begin with and then they pushed it off to uh, the Environment Court as a direct referral. Um, but at the council level decision making, they determined it to be a limited notification, which means not everyone gets a chance to have a, you know, voice their concerns. Um, and that was that right there um, was the beginning of a failed process, really. Public should have had their opportunity too to voice their concerns, not just Tanga Te Whenua. We only got our, we only got um, st status enough to give us a voice because we fought hard for it. We applied to the Environment Court. Um, you know, we had to do a whole lot of jumping through hoops to secure our, our right to have a voice. So it wasn't automatic. Um, but then not only did they not limit, uh, not notify the, the application, they also failed to recognise or failed to identify who are the affected people. And they didn't even, um, if you can remember Whareroa, the little, the old pa that for, from Tauranga Mona, they didn't recognise Sorry, they didn't acknowledge that Whareroa, the marae, the whānau, the community, the hapu from Whareroa were even affected parties. So that was one of the fights we had to have before we were even going in for the big battle. Um, and and through, that pro through that council assessment process and, and dis ultimately a decision was made, they actually granted partial elements of the overall um, proposal which weren't able to be um, challenged. Betcha you never heard that. <laughs> That's what happened. Um, so the Environment Court interim decision, it contemplates, it contemplates, it doesn't say we're going to give it, it contemplates granting a stage one consent, but it's subject to a whole lot of work that the port still has to do um, within the next six months and subject to a whole lot of conditions that will apply at that time too. Um, stage two is not a given. Stage two is um, the mount, more the mount side, and um, the court has signalled it's likely that they'll go to another, take that stage two application to another hearing. Um, integrated management in the decision was a real core focus for the court. I think it was mentioned what, 32, 31 times it was, it was um, addressed in the decision, and it's an interim decision, but it was one that the court identified was um, a failure in the application. The application failed to uh, address, and that the regional council hadn't addressed it either in the past, and what we were dealing with were um, a number of cumulative effects that had just been building and building and building from not just the port but um, industry around the port who are only there because of the port and you know needing to um, run their businesses. So um, so the, yeah so the court had this real strong focus on that um, integrated management cumulative effects um, concerns and issues. Well, these are some examples, just some excerpts from that decision around um, how they meet, how they are dealing with, how the court deals with integrated management in, in an interim way. I don't know if you want to take time to read that. But it, it picks up on those um, unaddressed effects that have been happening 
over time. So the top one it says just for the these for this whanau over here, um, the the nawe, the knuckle of it is that in our view it is also it is also what is meant by integrated management as sought to be achieved by the regional coastal environment plan in order to carry out the regional council's functions under section 30 of the act. So it's talking about uh, tangata whenua viewing effects holistically, and that included cumulative effects of air, water, land. Moana, Māori, and the pe of the people as well. And the next one was about cumulative effects again, highlighting that um, an assessment, uh, information is required to, before the court could make an assessment of whether the port's application satisfied the cumulative effects test. Um, and, the, and I just underlined, it also requires consideration of the integrated management of Te Awanui as a whole. So port zones, when you're, th when you're looking at integrated management and um, you know, good decision making, you can't just look within a port zone. And yet the planning tools, which are the things that are meant to help you achieve integrated management and, and set up the process for that, identify port zones and special rules for the port zone. So it's really tricky trying to traverse all this stuff. Cool. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, some really powerful statements. I mean, I, I, I encourage you to have a read of the port um, decision, the interim decision. Some really powerful stuff in there that may help you in your mahi. But the, um, this one, this powerful statement is about, it says the evidence indicate, this is the court saying this, it's pretty pretty harsh, the evidence indicates a systemic failure by the councils to undertake their functions in section 30 and 31 of the RMA. In particular, there's been a failure to achieve integrated management of resources and of the effects of the use of those resources. And that was in the context of Whareroa, like they've actually um, allowed that build up of industry around them, they've allowed um, um, heavy industry neighbour um, to be neighbours of a sensitive environment. So marae and, and um, communities are the sensitive environment in that context. And this last one, importantly, while the port zone provision, provisions contain some cross-references to certain policies in the regional coastal plan, it is clear when the regional plan is read as a whole that other management policies are also relevant to this case, particularly those concerning iwi and integrated management. So again, the port zone, you, you can't put your blinkers on and just say, plink, you know, port zone blinker, not looking further. Because, um, yeah, as the court pointed out, that's just not how it works. Yet, that's what we've been dealing with in terms of those authorities and their decision making. It's been like that for a long time. So just this is my last slide, I think. Um, there are some weaknesses in our framework. Consenting seems to be a real uh, particular one that um, just doesn't get everything else around it is really strong. There's some really good stuff in our R in the in the old RMA. You know, I'm not sure what's happening with that at the moment with our government, but w there's some really good stuff in there. It had the real it had the bones to be a really good um, tool. It was recognised worldwide as being a leading sort of bit of legislation, but the the, the breakdown happens when it's, a, when it's actually implemented by decision, like councils. Um, and this, this consistent and persistent um, theme of placing people before Tayo instead of, yeah, it's always, we're, you know, it's always got this human, or oh, we're above, we're above sort of um, approach. But I think Māori knew about, you know, Māori um, way of, Approaching Kopapa Taiyo, we knew the sages. You know, we knew this a long time ago. It's been part of our, our our culture, and when we do finally get a bit more recognition to be able to influence these things, I think, and allow us to lead some of the stuff, that's when we'll see a difference in terms of achieving integrated management. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> Where's my kai waiata now? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. I wish we had time for questions. Oh, but sorry. Perhaps if people want to 
mingle and have a chat to you yep. because we've got 15 minutes to set up the next oh, yeah. person. So yep. if you stick around. But that was a really interesting case and all good that you actually took the challenge yeah. because yeah. that's the only way you're going to get these things implemented yeah. properly. Yeah, unfortunately. And unfortunately it requires time and resources and energy. Yeah, and we had none. Yeah. We had no resources. Yeah. <laughs> but we still did it. So what's the current situation? Um, so currently there's an interim decision and the, and the court has made a whole lot of directions in that and said the port you need to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, mm. L, M, N, P and um, they've got a time frame within which they have to do that and meet um, th a lot of those directions. Um, some of them span from six months to out to two years because okay. it's still baseline stuff that they're they, they doing. They hadn't started dredging yet and they had, had they started all of this? Under the existing consent. Yeah. Under their existing consent, yes, I've done a lot of dredging. Okay. Yeah. Sounds like the whole plan is changing in the wider region. I think it might be true too. Yeah. Anyhow, fantastic. And it, it, it's a really good decision to see. Yeah, it is a good decision. Um, For once. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, thank you Where's very much. Where's that dude? I oh. think if people want to...